Hello, I'm Sheldon Axler, the author of Linear Algebra Done Right. This video discusses part two of the section of the book titled Generalized Eigenvectors and Nilpotent Operators. In this video, we will focus on generalized eigenvectors. Before getting to generalized eigenvectors, let's review our definitions concerning eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Suppose t is an operator on v. A number lambda is called an eigenvalue of t if there exists a nonzero vector v such that t of v is equal to lambda times v. Now to the definition of eigenvector, and it's, remember, easy to keep track of which is which eigenvalue versus eigenvector. An eigenvalue is a number, and an eigenvector is a vector. Here's the definition of an eigenvector. Suppose again, we have an operator t on v, and a scalar lambda in f, that's an eigenvalue of t. A vector is called an eigenvector of t corresponding to lambda if that vector is not zero, and t of that vector is lambda times that vector. Now let's recall the definition of an eigenspace. Suppose t is an operator on v and lambda is a scalar. The eigenspace of t corresponding to lambda, denoted e of lambda comma t, is defined to be the null space of t minus lambda i. Clearly, a vector v is in the null space of t minus lambda i if and only if t of v is equal to lambda v. Thus, we see that if lambda is not an eigenvalue of t, then e of lambda comma t is just the zero subspace. However, if lambda is an eigenvalue of t, then e of lambda comma t is uh, a subspace of v that has dimension bigger than or equal to 1. It's a subspace because uh, the null space of any operator is a subspace. And what we see is that e of lambda comma t is a set of eigenvectors of t corresponding to lambda along with the zero vector, which is excluded by definition from being an eigenvector. But of course, we want to include it in e of lambda t because we want a subspace. And obviously, we are using the letter e to denote the eigenspace to remind you of eigenvector. Now we are ready for a new definition. Suppose t is an operator on v and lambda is an eigenvalue of t. A vector v is called a generalized eigenvector of t corresponding to lambda if v is not zero and t minus lambda i raised to the jth power applied to v is equal to zero for some positive integer j. Thus, for example, if it works for j equals one, then v is an eigenvector of t. And thus you can see why we call this a generalized eigenvector. The generalized eigenspace, you can probably guess the definition. Suppose t is an operator on v and lambda is a scalar. The generalized eigenspace of t corresponding to lambda, denoted by g of lambda t, is defined to be the set of generalized eigenvectors of t corresponding to lambda along with the zero vector. And again, we're throwing in the zero vector so that we'll get a subspace, as we'll see. Obviously, again, we're using the letter g to remind you of generalized eigenvectors. We'll give some examples in just a minute, but first, one easy result. Suppose t is an operator on v and lambda is a scalar. Then the generalized eigenspace corresponding to lambda and t is equal to the null space of t minus lambda i raised to the power dimension of v. In other words, the definition of generalized eigenvector says we could have any integer j up there in the exponent, but actually we only need to consider um, the integer dimension of v. And the reason for that is the result we had previously showing that the null spaces don't change once you get past the dimension. Uh, this result also shows that g of lambda comma t is a subspace of v because it is the null space of some operator. Examples can help you understand what's going on, so let's look at an example. Define an operator t on C3 by the equation shown here. You should pause the video now and verify for yourself that the eigenvalues of t are 0 and 5, 
you can figure this out just from the definition of eigenvalues. You should also verify that the corresponding eigenspaces are easily seen to be the one-dimensional subspaces shown here. Again, please stop the video and verify these things. Now that you're back, note that this operator t does not have enough eigenvectors to span its domain C3. The two eigenspaces each have dimension 1, and we're working in a three-dimensional vector space C3. So these eigenvectors cannot span the space. Now let's turn to the question of finding the generalized eigenspaces of T. We have to find two of them because there are two distinct eigenvalues, 0 and 5. Let's start with the eigenvalue 0 and find the corresponding generalized eigenspace. That means we look at T minus 0i, that's just T, and by our previous result, we only have to raise it to the power of the dimension of the space, in this case that's 3, because we are working in C3. In other words, we need to find the null space of t cubed. Now it's easy to compute that t cubed is given by the formula shown here. You should stop the video and do that computation yourself to verify this. Now, the generalized eigenspace corresponding to 0 is the null space of t cubed, and from the formula above for t cubed, we see that that null space is the vectors whose z3, the third coordinate, is 0. In other words, the generalized eigenspace corresponding to 0 is the subspace displayed here. Now let's look at the eigenvalue 5 for this operator and find its generalized eigenspace. That means we need to look at t minus 5i cubed. And here's the formula for that. Again, please stop the video and verify that this formula is correct. Once we have that formula, the uh, generalized eigenspace corresponding to the eigenvalue 5 is the set of vectors such that that vector on the right is 0, which means that both z1 and z2 have to be 0. Thus we see that the generalized eigenspace in this case is a set of vectors of the form 0, 0, z3. Notice that c3 is the direct sum of these two generalized eigenspaces. The first generalized eigenspace we found has dimension 2, the second one has dimension 1. I point this out because we will see later that this always happens. We get a really nice decomposition of our vector space into generalized eigenspaces. That theorem will come in a later video. Here's the last result in this video. This result says that generalized eigenvectors corresponding to distinct eigenvalues are linearly independent. Recall that we had a similar result for just eigenvectors, so this generalizes that result. Let's look at the proof. So we have an operator t and lambda 1 up through lambda n are distinct eigenvalues of t, and v1 up to vm are corresponding generalized eigenvectors. We want to prove that these generalized eigenvectors are linearly independent. So we look at a linear combination of them that is equal to 0, and now we have to prove that all those coefficients, a1 up to am, are equal to 0. That's the definition of linearly independent. Let's focus on the vector v1, the first generalized eigenvector. Let k be the largest non-negative integer, such that t minus lambda 1 times i raised to the kth power applied to v1 is not 0. We know that if we raise it to some large power, we do get 0 because it's a generalized eigenvector. But to some power, it's not. Even if we have to take k equal to 0, we just get the identity applied to v1. That's certainly not 0 because v1, by definition, is not 0. Now let w be that non-zero vector, t minus lambda 1i to the kth power applied to v1. Now apply t minus lambda i to both sides of the previous equation. We get t minus lambda i applied to w is equal to t minus lambda i raised to the power k plus 1 applied to v1. But that vector is 0 because k was the largest non-negative integer that would give us a non-zero thing. So if we add one more, we're going to get 0. 
The last equation in the first column implies that t of w is equal to lambda 1 times w. Thus it's easy to see that t minus lambda i applied to w is equal to lambda 1 minus lambda applied to w for every scalar lambda. Let's iterate that and we get the t minus lambda i to the nth power applied to w is equal to lambda 1 minus lambda to the nth power applied to w for every lambda and for every positive integer n, but we're actually just interested in n equal to the dimension of v. Now, apply the operator shown here to both sides of the equation now shown in red in the first column. Apply that operator to both sides. The left side we get 0, and you can see what we get on the right side. Notice that the operator we're applying has t minus lambda 1i raised to the kth power, but all the other t minus lambda ji are raised to the nth power. Now, let's um, look at this equation. Um, in the equation above, I've highlighted in red um, t minus lambda 1i to the kth power and the v1. Commute the t minus lambda i to the kth power over to where it's just in front of the v1, and then t minus lambda i applied to the kth power of v1 is w. So that gives us the last equation now shown here. You probably want to pause the video for a minute to look at that to make sure you understand how that equation came about. Now, use the equation in red higher up in this same column to get the next equation um, that follows immediately. And this equation applies that a1 has to be 0, because all the lambdas are distinct, so lambda 1 minus lambda 2 is not 0, up to lambda 1 minus lambda m is not 0. w is not 0, because we chose it that way, so this forces a1 to be 0. That's the first coefficient. Well, there's nothing special about the first coefficient. You can do a similar argument to conclude that all the coefficients are 0, or just relabel. And because all the coefficients are 0, we conclude that v1 up to vm is linearly independent, which is what we wanted to prove. That completes the proof. This concludes part 2 of the video on generalized eigenvectors and nilpotent operators. If you see a small picture of a slide in the upper left-hand corner of this slide, then you can click on it to get to the next video. If you see a small picture of part of the cover of linear algebra done right, in the upper right corner of this slide, then you can click on it to get to the book's website.